Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. If you want to say hello in the chat box, let us know where, where you're joining us from. We have Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, California, Minnesota, Tennessee, Washington, Florida. Great, Oregon. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Again, welcome. Your phone line is muted. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording and slides will be shared. Hello again, welcome to our webinar on fostering family engagement. My name is Leslie Gabay Swanston. I'm the Director of Program and Systems Quality for the National Summer Learning Association. Before we get started, here's a quick overview of our discussions today. First, I'll share a little bit about NSLA for those who are unfamiliar before we hear from our expert panel. After that, we'll have a little, time, a little bit of time for group discussion, and then we'll have some time to answer your audience questions. Uh, then we'll wrap up with some announcements about upcoming events and webinars. As we're going along, if you have any questions for our panel panelists, please put them in the Q&A box. We'll try to catch them if they're in the chat box, but it's a little harder to see there. So if you have a question that you would like asked and answered live, please put it in the Q&A box. The National Summer Learning Association is the only national nonprofit exclusively focused on addressing the achievement and opportunity gaps by increasing access to summer learning opportunities. NSLA's goal is to increase nationwide the number of high quality summer learning programs. To achieve this goal, NSLA recognizes and disseminates what works, offers expertise and support for programs and communities, and advocates for summer learning as a solution for equity and excellence in education. NSLA's work is driven by the belief that all children and youth deserve high quality summer learning experiences that will help them succeed in college, career, and life. Core to our work is the recognition that high quality summer learning programs work and have been shown to improve reading and math skills, school attachment, motivation, and relationships with adults and peers. We know that summer is a time of great inequity for young people. And we believe that promoting and supporting summer opportunities is a way to address this. This goes beyond the summer learning that's in our name. We also wanna see programs and communities addressing access to other resources like meals and youth employment. Summer is a time of innovation and exploration. Without some of the constraints of the school year, kids are able to try different ways of learning, interact with other adults and peers that they might not otherwise. It's also a time of innovation for adults, whether that's opportunities for professional development, trying out new teaching methods, or exploring new partnerships. So I'm happy to introduce our first speakers, Cordelia Caliste, Director of Partnerships in, uh, at Learning Heroes, and David Park, Senior Vice President of Stra Strategy and Communications. That I'll turn things over to them. Thank you, Leslie. This is David Park uh, with Learning Heroes and really excited to be a part of uh, this webinar. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We don't have very long and I wanna make sure that we have time for Cornelia to go over some of the, the resources, the research-based resources that we have at Learning Heroes. Cornelia, are you, are you doing the slides? Okay. Just wanna make sure we're moving forward. There we go. Um, just a little bit of information about Learning Heroes. Um, we've been around for about five years and our mission is to support parents as their um, number one education advocate and we do that by doing a lot of research and also um, using that research 
uh, to create res um, research-based communications for parents and families. Uh, we partner with organizations all across the country, um, and here are some of those organizations, including in SLA and, and many others, um, because we feel like um, in order to uh, best serve parents, um, we need to make sure that the information that they're receiving comes from trusted sources. So a lot of times we'll do the research, we create with the help of our partners, we create materials, but in terms of the dissemination, it's usually through the national or local organizations. And I um, just wanted to emphasize that if you're interested in any of our materials and resources that Cornelia is gonna go over, please get in touch with us. We're more than happy to provide them for you. Uh, you can put your logos on them. Uh, we can definitely co-brand or anything you're interested in in terms of reaching your um, your networks of parents and families. Um, so moving forward, um, as I mentioned, we we focus on research because we understand that the best way for us to communicate with parents is first to listen to them. And so we've done 13 national surveys, over 200 focus groups. All of the um, research that we've done is in English and Spanish, and we focus on low-income parents and parents of color. Uh, and moving to the next slide, um, and the next one, I just wanted to start talk about our most recent uh, research, which is called Parents 2020. And we actually moved it up. It was going to happen later in the year. But because of COVID-19 and this, um, this critical moment in time, we wanted to talk to parents right now and see kind of how they were experiencing their child's education and the kinds of tools and resources that, that, that would be helpful to them. So this was a nationally representative survey. Over 3,600 3, parents were surveyed. Um, parents of, of elementary, middle, and high schools. We did oversamples among African American parents, Hispanic parents, as well as those in transitional grades. Um, we also did oversamples in a few different states. Um, and so, um, moving to the next slide, um, I'll go ahead and start talking about some of the, um, the findings and specifically what we found in terms of overall insights. Parents are activated. This is an incredibly cha challenging time for parents and guardians right now, but from their new front row seat into their child's education, and despite all these challenges, they're leaning in, they're engaging more deeply in their child's schooling um, than most have ever engaged before. And, and this is the exciting part, a lot of parents will show up differently in the new school year. And also, um, we found, uh, sorry, go, if you could go back, uh, Cornelia, just one, one to the last slide, I, I just wanted to go through the other two. Um, so, so the second insight is that parents deserve an accurate picture. Um, so right now, um, and, and I'll talk about this in just a second, over nine in 10 parents think their child is at or above grade level in reading and math. And what we're finding is with COVID-19 is they're spending more time with their kids. What we thought was maybe spending more time with their kids, they'll realize, well, my child might not be in grade level and might need additional supports in these areas. But what we're finding is, is that number is actually going up. It's 92% of, um, of parents now think their child is at or above grade level in reading and math. And in reality, it's closer to 37%. And we feel that in order for ch um, parents to be the um, advocate on behalf of their, their, um, their children that they, they need to be and they want to be, uh, that they deserve an accurate and complete picture of where their child is academically and developmentally. And finally, um, this is a period um, where we believe that the relationship between families and schools can be changed. Um, this is a moment to establish clear expectations for parents and teachers and their relationships, and it's, it should be a relationship that's really grounded in trust and a shared understanding of their child's academic achievement. So to go into a little bit deeper on a couple of the, the findings, um, one of the things that we found is that education is a top priority for parents right now during COVID-19 school, school closures. So if you take a look at this slide, um, you know, the, the very top, and this I think is important to those, the, the people on this, on, the, on this webinar, is your kids missing important social interactions at schools or, or, or with friends. Because um, a lot of parents are feeling that because their children have been home for a long time, they're really missing out on those important social, action, um, social interactions. So that really tops the list. Um, but also we see up there making sure your child stays on track so he or she is help, um, ready for the next grade. Um, 
how school, school closures and changes will have a negative impact on your child's education. Um, so there's a lot of education related concerns on behalf of parents, even higher than concerns around being able to, to pay the bills and having enough food to, to feed the family. Although those, those two are very, very high. We can move on to the next slide. Um, so we also um, notice that parents feel more connected now than ever to their child's education. So 67%, nearly 7 in 10, said that they're more connected with their child's day-to-day -day education than ever before. Um, 7 in 10, 70% said that they wanted to know what material that their child had missed at the end of the year due, due to school closures and how their school plans up to make, to make up that material. They are very interested in finding how they can help their child be on track for the next school year. In the next slide. Um, and so again, here is the, the slide that I was talking about before, um, that even though children, um, parents are at home with their kids, uh, a lot of parents still think that their child um, is at or above grade level. And so we feel like it's really important and we've developed some tools and resources for parents that help them have a more accurate picture of where their child is academically and what supports they need and what tools and resources are available to them. You can go on to the next slide. Sorry, I'm rushing through these. I just wanna make sure that we get to the resources and we'll have time for questions as, as well. Um, and again, and this is a, an exciting slide to me that parents are activated to really redefine the relationships between school and parents. Um, sorry, between educators and, and parents. And so um, what we asked, you know, if what are you likely to do different in the upcoming school year? Um, we had 73% per, percent of parents say they are um, likely to get a better understanding of what my child is expected to learn at his or her new grade level. 72% um, said that they want to find more time to talk to their kids about their everyday assignments. 69% um, say they seek a better understanding of where their child is academically. Um, likewise, talking to the teacher about what parents notice during the school closure, 64%, and developing a stronger relationship with a child's teacher than they've had in the past. So this is an opportunity, I think, for all of us uh, to really lean and help parents um, in, in their support of their child and their child's academics. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and skip over these slides because I just wanna make sure, Cornelia, we have time for, um, for the resources. So you know, why don't we go ahead and, and start the resources section? I don't wanna go over time, sorry. Yep, no problem. Thanks, David, for sharing. And so what we're about to share is some engagement resources that you as partners can be able to use with your families. And we wanted to take the opportunity to show those. I forgot I'm just controlling the slides. And so what we have here is an opportunity for like our customized and co-branded parent resources. So what we start with being able like a conversation starter that we use from Puzzle to Plan, which is also available in the print and um, digital versions. You can see in the left hand side. And then we launched three seasonal campaigns, which are our, our summer, um, our super summer five back to school power moves. We also have spring forward and then we also have our summer stride which gives families which we're getting ready to launch that is also in um in combination with um um launching on sorry um june the 15th and so i just wanted to make sure that you all are able to see where our seasonal campaigns lie it's slower for me oh and what we have here is one of our other branded resources. I went back. Just excited to show a lot of resources. Let me see. Sorry. Oh, this is exciting. <laughs> We're going to show the video and then be able to go back to the resources. Ready for school? Find out with Learning Heroes Readiness Check, a free online tool for students in grades K through 8. Your child will answer three to five questions about math and reading. It only takes a few minutes, and it isn't a test. It's more like a game. You might be surprised by what your child does and doesn't know. <laughs> 
Mira, lo hiciste muy bien. I did really well. At the end, you'll get fun, free activities and resources to help your child succeed in school. You can share what you learned with your child's teacher. Uh, Hi, nice to meet you. So you can work together to make sure your child stays on track. Keep reading the books you enjoy. And I think it's good to talk about what's happening in the stories. Visit WNET.org slash families for the readiness check and other tips to support learning at home. Great, so I'm gonna just take, I know we have just about two minutes to be able to go back and actually show you, and you can um, find these resources on our website. We had our Keep Calm Learning is On tool, which we used during the time of the COVID era to be able to support families in distant learning. I forgot it's a little bit of a delay. And so here you can see that this material is available in English and Spanish, in digital and in a print version. And so to be able to walk you all through the slides is being able to focus on key skills is what our readiness check talks a lot about. And that's the video that you also just saw. Keeping a routine, which is important during this time as well, like creating a cool daily schedule with their children that it calls to include math and reading, having different choice, student buy-in is really important. Staying connected with your school during this time is important for educators and parents to connect with their families because during this time is also knowing that as we prepare for summer, staying in touch with teachers, you'll be able to kind of ask for help, but then also know that you can work through some of the challenges or even celebrate some of the successes together. Another thing that was also important is like turning off the news and talk, which limits the opportunity for you to just connect with your students, but then also being able to inform your child that how they're feeling and that life will get to a sense of normalcy during that time. And then also they can use different tools such as like drawing or writing about it. And then enjoying family time as the summer proposes, um, playing cards, maybe sitting out back, making up silly songs, giving them an opportunity to kind of just connect and then making learning fun. Right. And here's our Learning Heroes roadmap that you can also find on our website at BeALearningHero.org where we talk a lot about of our year around family engagement tools where we have the Learning Heroes roadmap, the readiness check that I just spoke about, the developing life skills on how learning happens, and also a puzzle to plan, which is a really cool tool in being able to come in print and digital version. We showed the video, hope it's not gonna show again. And this is a little bit more about the readiness check just in detail and how you can help your kids with math and reading at home, having them answer about three to five questions as a quick math review, understanding that it's not necessarily an exam, so you can make a game out of it. And then you'll have access to be able to have fun, free activities to help your children at home. And then also, again, how can these resources support your family engagement? Like post this on your parent blogs, on the resources, school websites, and parent portals. These tips can be used as part of like digital follow-ups, important through text newsletters, and also social media. We also can customize these. And so providing a printed take-home version learning packets for students and families during this time. And if you have other ideas, we're open to hearing more about it. And I hope that was our time. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me as Director of Partnerships with Learning Heroes. And also, David, if you have additional questions about our research um, and development tools. Great. Thank you so much, David and Cornelia. So next, we're going to hear from Alejandro Gek Artigas founder and chief executive officer of Springboard Collaborative. Awesome, thanks. All right, uh, so we've got 15, uh, 15 minutes together. I'm gonna to start with the briefest of introductions, uh, give a bit of background on, on me and on Springboard, uh, but the bulk of our time, I'm gonna share Springboard's recipe uh, for helping parents to support learning at home I'm going to run through an example to kind of bring it all to life. Uh, and then finally, I want to share uh, several different ways that you can use that recipe in your own school communities. 
Uh, but as a parent engagement organization, it's only right that I start with a shout out to my parents. Uh, there they are on the left. That's me in my mom's lap. Uh, I'm half Chilean, half Puerto Rican. My parents escaped political persecution uh, uh, in Chile in 1973. My dad wrote a play in protest of the dictator Pinochet that went over about as well as you'd expect it to. But they made it out alive uh, and they immigrated to the US so that my sister and I could have better educational opportunities. The reason I mention it is that growing up in a, a home with little money but lots of love, it taught me that parents' love for their children is the single greatest and most underutilized natural resource in education. Um, and I took that experience with me into the classroom. Uh, after I graduated college, I became a first grade teacher in North Philadelphia, a Puerto Rican neighborhood. I easily saw myself and my students. I saw my parents and their parents. Uh, but I quickly became frustrated that my school and, and more broadly our system was approaching low income parents like my own as liabilities rather than as assets. I, I remember I began to picture my students time as an orange and and they were only in my classroom for a, a relatively small wedge, 25% of their, their waking hours. Try as I might to squeeze more and more juice from that wedge, if I didn't find a way to, to bring parents into the instructional process and, and juice the rest of the orange, uh, I knew we were never, never going to close the uh, achievement gap, let alone the opportunity gap. So long story short, I founded Springboard eight years ago with the vision of closing the literacy gap by bridging the gap between home and school. And we do that by coaching teachers and low-income parents to help kids read on grade level. Let's see if the slides cooperate. Cool. In a simpler time, um, that was too far. There it is. In a simpler world, we did that work in person, uh, serving 10,000 kids up and down each coast uh, and launching in, in the Midwest. Uh, and it took the shape of five and 10 week programs that combined personalized reading instruction for pre-K through third graders, weekly workshops, training parents to teach reading at home uh, and professional development for teachers. Each of those short programs would average between a three and four month reading gain, closing the gap uh, to grade level performance by more than half. And the only way we could get those outcomes with the very same teachers with whom kids were, were struggling in the classroom is by mobilizing parents in unprecedented ways. Our weekly workshops get 91% parent attendance. Uh, families learn how to become one-on-one -on -one reading coaches uh, to their children at home. Uh, and importantly, they build habits that, that long outlive uh, the programs. Uh, not just the habit of, of reading regularly with their kids uh, you know, for an average 24 minutes a night, but maybe even more importantly, the, the habit of setting and achieving goals together, uh, which of course has implications far beyond literacy. Uh, of course, the world looks different now and in-person programming just is, isn't a thing. Uh, however, uh, we had spent a lot of time uh, over the last year uh, reflecting on what exactly is it about our programs that's driving the, the impact? What is kind of the, the secret sauce? What's the recipe uh, that, that we can pull out from the programs? Uh, and spread far beyond the, the boundaries uh, of, uh, of the organization. So here's what we landed on. Uh, we call it Family Educator Learning Accelerators. Uh, and it's basically a, a five to 10 week cycle during which teachers and parents share a game plan to help children reach learning goals. Plain and simple, it measurably, measurably improves academic outcomes while strengthening the relationships between teachers and families. Uh, we learned that any shorter than five weeks, it's not quite long enough to build a habit. Uh, any longer than 10 weeks, then you kind of lose the immediacy and the urgency that get a parent and teacher to be willing to try something new together. We know that relationships are foundational. That the way you get 91% of parents to attend a weekly workshop is, is by first doing a, a home visit, uh, whether that's in person uh, or we've kind of now built the, the virtual equivalent of that, uh, of that relationship building. And in that initial touch point, you need to set a goal. The goal is the magic. The goal is the active ingredient in, uh, in our, our secret sauce. The process needs to be winnable. Uh, so once you've got your relationship and you've got your goal, then you practice. Over the course of the, the five or, or 10 week cycle, uh, kids are practicing uh, with their teacher, uh, whether that's in-person classroom instruction or, or, or virtual uh, uh, instruction. They got to practice with the, the educator. They've got to practice with their family uh, and we have a web app that kind of supports parents on a daily basis. What do I do with my kid for 15 minutes today? How do I make the most uh, of, uh, of uh, learning at home? Uh, 
And then in addition to practicing with the family, the teachers and the families need to practice together. Uh, whether that's an in-person workshop or, or a virtual one, the teachers and families coming together at least four times during that five or 10 week cycle uh, is what creates the team. It's what shares the skills and, and, and creates the mutual accountability uh, that makes the whole thing work. And then finally, at the end of the cycle, you need to measure progress. You, you have to know whether or not you reached your goal and you celebrate. Uh, it's punctuating the experience with a, a quick win. That's what crystallizes the habits, both for the, the families and for the teachers. I know that all is a little abstract. Uh, so we're gonna run through an example quickly uh, of, of what that actually looks like. So in this example, uh, Salim is our learner. He's five years old, kindergarten kid. Uh, his mom is an essential worker. She's worried uh, about him falling further behind uh, this summer. Uh, Salim's school uh, is using Springboard's methodology uh, through a virtual summer learning. So they've, they've reached out to Springboard, they've asked for our support, uh, and we're doing so in the context of, of, of a Springboard Learning Accelerator. So let's get started, shall we? Um, we'll start at the beginning. The, the, the first step, as we talked about, you, you've got to build your team. You need to know where you're starting uh, and you need a goal. Before you get to any of the practice, those are the pieces that, that you need to have in place. And they can all happen within the, the same uh, within the same touch point. So building a team, uh, put in a, a, a Karen Map quote in there because you gotta. Uh, the relationship is the glue that that holds it all together, um, and, and we guide the interaction between the teacher and the family. Uh, during that moment, uh, the teacher is both sharing more information about what their partnership is going to look like uh, uh, over the course of the five or ten weeks. Uh, but just as importantly, they're, they're learning uh, about the, the child. They're gaining from the expertise that a family uh, has a, a, about their own child uh, as a learner and, and as a person. During that same meeting, uh, they also get a baseline. You wanna know where, where you're starting so that you can set a, a goal. Uh, and within Springboard Connect, uh, which is our web app, uh, we have a questionnaire uh, that parents give uh, uh, with their own children. Uh, that, that enables them to get a sense for how is my kid doing in, in reading as a learner today. Um, a lot of the research that, that David shared at Learning Heroes, that parents think their kid is doing okay, but, but, but they're not actually, uh, it, it's important for families to have a, a, a clear sense uh, for where the child is starting. And once you have your starting point, then you set a goal. Uh, the way that looks within our, our web app is that the, based on the questionnaire, uh, Connect identifies one of four literacy domains where that child most needs to focus their reading support, uh, and it identifies five strategies that, that will most help that learner in particular to, to make progress. Uh, and the goal uh, is for the family to master at least three of those five strategies by, by the end of the cycle. All right, so the teacher and the family have a relationship, you know where you're starting, you have a goal, now you're ready to get to the good stuff, which is Practice, practice, practice. So as I mentioned, family and the teacher, they, the, the, they need to practice together. Uh, that takes the form uh, of a workshop. There's a picture of what a workshop looked like when interpersonal interaction was a thing. Uh, we now do these virtually, but, but they accomplish much the, much the same thing. Here's the basic structure. There, there's a welcome, uh, there's a reading tip. The teacher kind of models a, a, a strategy. And then the heart of it is practice time. The families practice that strategy with their child sitting right next to them. And the teacher is able to provide feedback uh, so that the families can gain confidence uh, in, uh, in being able to, to play the role uh, of teacher at home. In addition to those weekly workshops, uh, the child also needs to practice with their educator. Uh, the family can listen in if they want, but the, there's no obligation to, to do so. Uh, amidst COVID, we're structuring these uh, as 30 minute instructional sections, uh, sessions primarily focused on uh, code based uh, instruction, kind of guided for the, the teacher to be able to make the most uh, of the time with an opportunity for the child to read out loud uh, and the teacher to, to individually conference with the student and provide feedback. In addition, to the family and teacher practicing together, uh, in addition to the teacher and the student practicing together, the child needs to practice with, Salim needs to practice with his mom, uh, with their family. Uh, connect uh, the web app, uh, it provides kind of daily tips so that you know, uh, for these minutes that I'm spending together with my child reading, 
what kinds of questions should I be asking before, during, and after reading in, in order to, to help them make progress. All right, we're just gonna keep it moving. Cool. So five weeks are passed. Uh, Salim's done a whole bunch of reading practice. And uh, now it's time to measure progress and celebrate together. This is the, the key part to turning this all into a, a habit and not just a, a, a flash in the pan. And here we are. So families use that, that same tool, that same questionnaire at the end of the program uh, to see how they did. Whether or not kids reached uh, uh, their goal, whether or not they mastered three of the five strategies, it, it's still time to celebrate. Uh, within the context of, uh, of a springboard uh, supported program, as opposed to a school that's kind of using this methodology entirely independently, uh, we provide rewards uh, for families. Uh, families earn stars uh, on the app as they read with their kid at home, uh, as they attend uh, the, the weekly workshop with the teacher, as the child attends the, the weekly lessons with the teacher, all that earns your points, uh, which at the end, uh, you can earn a backpack and, and school supplies so that your siblings ready uh, to start the, the upcoming academic year. All right. Huh. Okay, my slides look a little different than yours, but that is fine, just fine. Uh, I wanna share, so that's what it looks like, that, that's like the, the sum total of, of having done this work for, for 10 years, that, that's the recipe, that, that's the magic. And, and there's a, a number of ways that, um, there's a number of ways that you can use that in your, in your own community. I, I wanna run through uh, a handful of them. The one that I will, let's see if I can, um, if I can track down, great. So the, these are the ways that you can actually use this recipe for, for yourself. Uh, one is that we, we open sourced a toolkit. Uh, the, it's like a five page uh, toolkit that includes templates and kind of all, all the materials that, that you would need for any teacher anywhere to start engaging families in, in these goal setting cycles. Uh, it's freely available. We want it to grow far beyond the boundaries uh, of, uh, of our organization. Even though Springboard focuses on literacy, we built the, the toolkit so that any teacher, anywhere, any subject area can, um, can, can find value in it. Uh, the president of our organization used uh, uh, Fila to uh, help her kid get better at basketball. Uh, uh, her and the coach were the, the partners and they set a goal, they practiced together and, and, and um, voila. So to my point, any subject area, uh, uh, it's really just a, a way, uh, a structure for teachers and families to, to work together in order to help kids make progress. Uh, it's on our website, download it, uh, and, and uh, hopefully you'll find use in it. Uh, there's a partnership we have with TFA that, that is another way um, to, to uh, engage. I'll share a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, Springboard Learning Accelerator, if you want our support running a, a FILA, whether it's a virtual summer learning or, or something in the fall, uh, as an organization, that's, that's what we do. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll mention a little bit about the, uh, the app as uh, something that may be of value to families in your network. All right, so now I'm gonna back it on up to Teach for America. This is exciting. Um, so Springboard is partnering with Teach for America to offer free remote summer programming for up to 9,000, hold on. For up to 9,000 uh, pre-K through fourth graders across the country, com completely free. Uh, all 3,000 uh, of their incoming core members uh, are going to implement the FILA methodology that we just ran through uh, with teams of up to, to three students each. Uh, and over four weeks, starting June 15th, right around the corner, uh, kids and families uh, that are participating, that they will receive personalized phonics instruction, the family workshops that we went through, daily reading tips and reminders via Springboard Connect, uh, access to eBooks, uh, and then finally the, the rewards, the, the backpacks and, and, uh, and school supplies. It's completely paid for, uh, and, and it's a first come, first serve process for families to be able to, uh, to benefit. So here on our website, there, there's kind of two ways to, to take advantage of this. As an institution, if you want to claim a spot for a certain number of, uh, uh, of families, uh, uh, kind of in your school or, or in your community, uh, 
on our resource page for school leaders. Uh, there, there's a, a short application. You say, uh, I'm a school leader in wherever, and, and I think 200 kids uh, 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 should, should benefit from this. Uh, and then we reach out and we support the, the recruitment and outreach effort. We just opened up the application process last week, uh, and we've got seven uh, of 9,000 uh, uh, spots that have already been claimed. Uh, so the, the window's closing, but uh, if, if as an, an institution or organization, you, you want to claim some of the re remaining spots for the families in, in your orbit, uh, do so quickly and, and then we'll support you in actually uh, recruiting and signing up the families. Alternatively, if you are just a, a parent serving organization, if you're a parent serving organization uh, and you just want to share this with families so that they can sign up directly, uh, we have blurbs and, and flyers uh, uh, for doing so uh, and families to sign up directly uh, on our website. Uh, so two ways to engage, but I, I want to make this opportunity known uh, to you all so that families uh, in your orbit can, can benefit. The very last thing I'll mention, because I know I'm up on time, uh, is Springboard Connect. Uh, whether or not a, a family has a, a, a teaching, a teacher as a partner to, to participate in this kind of a, a goal setting cycle, uh, they can still benefit from the, the daily reading tips, uh, reminders, and, and guidance. Um, so any and every family, it's freely available for parents. So if you think this would be of value to the families in your communities, know that this is a tool at your disposal. Um, my email address, as you can guess from my name, is incredibly complicated. So feel free to just reach out to info at springboard, springboardcollaborative.org uh, if you want to have further dialogue. Otherwise, everything that we talked about uh, is available uh, on the resource portal on our website. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Alejandro. So next we're going to hear from Melissa Cedeno, Managing Director of Family and Community Engagement at DREAM. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I turn my camera off, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. This is an especially dark time in our world, not only for us, but many of the families uh, that we serve. So I do hope that you can benefit from some of our practices and experiences as, as we've responded to our families in this, during this pandemic. What I'll share here is just a picture, a small, small picture of what it is that we've done to engage our families. Our first efforts in the, the first couple of days when our school was about to shut down, we made sure that we uh, provided Chromebooks to nearly 500 of our families. It was about two weeks later that we were able to put a Chromebook in the hands of all of our families so that they can have the tools that they needed to engage in distance learning. And during this time, the entire Dream Team was working tirelessly to make sure that our students were getting everything they need to succeed. So the data team's role in this part was to make sure that they track and record those efforts um, so that we can expand on what was working, what could work and what we needed to improve upon. This was a huge collaboration process with multiple teams across our camp campuses and, and we couldn't express um, how important it was for us to collect information about what we were doing and how we were doing it so that we, can, uh, we could improve DREAM's distance learning program for attendance policy, for family engagement initiatives, and for determining our grading standards. So what you see right here is just one of the trackers that we created. And in this particular tracker, we record how many families have been contacted. But what's unique to my team in particular is to monitor the number of reports of food insecurity. So our teachers in pre-K through high school consistently check in with families. And during those check-ins, they make sure that families express if they need any food or any other supplies, and we are able to provide that to them in a timely fashion. Um, what you'll also notice is that uh, we were able to email 531 report cards to our families so that they could have the tools they needed to engage uh, effectively in the conferences. So 
something we also realized very, very, very early on that it was important to ask families how they were experiencing this new way of living and learning and the areas where they believe that we could improve. So about two weeks ago, we administered a survey to families to get their feedback on how they were experiencing remote learning and how we could best support them and their child. The survey was open for about a week and, and roughly one third of our families responded with pretty much even representation across schools and grades. And more than half of our respondents said that distance learning was going very well for their child. Obviously we were happy uh, for that report. About 79% of our families agreed they're getting what they need from DREAM. And based on that family feedback, the top two opportunities for increased support on our end were student motivation and teacher feedback on completed assignments. And so we've been working diligently in that area to provide uh, students with more feedback. And at the end of the survey, we asked the following optional open-ended question, is there something DREAM is doing well or something DREAM needs to do better? And incredibly, we received over 200 responses. And I'll share a little bit of those later on in my presentation. So here is a student's perspective, Leslie. You can play it when you have a moment. Okay, give it there with me one moment. Hi, Ms. Davis. Hi, Ms. Lewis. It's um, Nevea. I'm so happy that you all gave us this because I know it's a lot of work, but it helps us more to get more information about your text, music, all that when we've been working so hard. And I just thank you and appreciate it. Bye. Thank you, Leslie. That um, video gets me every time. Uh, a week after we started remote learning is when um, that student and her mom shared um, her perspective on this thing called distant learning that she had not experienced before. One of the things that uh, we're also doing is uh, providing financial assistance for families and legends who have experienced one or more of the following. Um, legends are, are graduates of our program, uh, our after school program. They're high school graduates who've gone on to college and unfortunately many of them are having challenges as well as they return home and some of them are stuck on college campuses. And so this, these are the areas where we have noticed that our families have the most needs. And so we have them complete a brief uh, survey. We have, we have a case manager to walk each um, family or legend through the process of us providing them with direct financial assistance or um, public resources that we can um, provide them access to. We are very, very fortunate to have a partner in um, Katzman Produce. Stephanie um, Katzman uh, is one of our longtime supporters. And as this, this crisis continues to challenge our resolve, as well as our families, we, we want to be able to support them in whatever way that we can. And so this is our fourth week of being able to distribute food to over 200 families. And thank goodness we'll be able to continue doing that. In addition to the support uh, with food insecurity, we also have a support group that range from working with adolescents, meditation, yoga, simply general support with families share their experience, strength, and hope with each other. And it's something, it's a practice that we intend to carry through as we move on and end up going back to our respective campuses. And so here are just a few of the messages our family shared with us in the family survey. I'll give you a second to read that. So in closing, um, we've captured all the major moves 
that we've made either through a tracker or a dashboard and we've communicated with families on a consistent basis. We've listened to families and children and we've responded to as many needs as possible in a timely fashion. So thank you very much. And that concludes my time with you. And we have some time for questions and answers. It's all yours, Leslie. Hey, thank you, Melissa. Um, so next we're gonna have a, a little bit of discussion with Laura Johnson, our Vice President of Communications at NSLA. Um, and while she's asking a couple, our panelists a couple questions, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to type those into the Q&A box. Um, so that uh, I'll ask our panelists to turn their video on. And Laura, if you wanna go ahead, your question. Thank you. This has been such a rich conversation and thank you for sharing. Uh, there is a moment right now where family engagement is more, more critical than, than ever before. And I heard a few things that were really, um, that really touched me. Uh, one, that parents are activated. And I think that's, in really, that's really important for, for educators and program providers to know. Um, the other thing that I heard was that parents, the parents, Love is one of the un, underutilized assets that we have, um, not only during this moment, but throughout the school year. And so to the panelists, I wanted to ask you, um, how, how do you recommend that program providers, school districts document and formalize the feedback that they're hearing from parents during this time? Um, I think David, you said that parents have a front seat. Uh, we know that they're first teachers, but they're seeing uh, and observing things that are different about this moment and this, uh, this, this time that they're teaching, trying to teach their children. So what would you say about um, how we document and formalize that going into the summer and going into a school year? And I'll start and then others feel free to weigh in. Um, but absolutely, Laura, I think one of the things that we heard loud and clear from parents is they're noticing a lot more, they're more engaged, they're leaning in in terms of their child's education. Um, and we have as out of school time providers, as educators, um, we have a responsibility, I think, to, to ask parents what they're noticing. You know, if they're not going to necessarily be forthcoming about it, and a lot of them say they are, some of them may not, but ask parents, you know, what is it, um, where do you feel like your child needs additional support, you know, and, and we've also encouraged parents before the school ends to ask teachers, you know, um, what should I focus on this summer? A lot of our campaigns are including our summer campaign is all about kind of um, arming parents with that information so that they'll have a better sense of, of um, kind of what are some of the tools and resources that they can use during the summer to help their, their kids. But that ongoing dialogue and for, um, for whether you're an out of school time provider or, um, or an educator to just be able to kind of keep track of that and more important that to, to have that ongoing two way conversation um, with the parent. And I think, think parents are very open to that now. Thank you for that. Melissa, I, I just want to, to lift up that Family engagement is such part of the DNA of, of DREAM, and, and we know DREAM intimately because they are uh, an award-winning summer program of NSLA. Um, but can you speak to, to this moment? Because you have always had strong connections with students. And so I remember someone from DREAM saying that you're more connected during this moment than you've ever been because you're in the homes of, of children every day and with their families. And so how do you carry that for those that don't have that in their DNA already? How do you carry that into the summer and carry that connection that's, that's already there, at least with the dream? How do you carry that into the school year? What does that look like organically and authentically? Well, not only are we in families' homes, they're in our homes, right? There's a level of forced vulnerability, right, that we've embraced and what it's allowed educators and parents um, the opportunity to do is to really know each other in a far more intimate way and so the platforms that we use are not only the support groups but town halls where teachers and leaders and families are talking about how they're experiencing life and learning at this at this time and so 
we never had as many town halls as we've had now with families. And we're very, very deliberate about the family surveys that we ask them to complete. We don't want families to feel like we're wasting their time and we want them to see that we're acting in a timely fashion when we get their feedback uh, during surveys. And so our communication, it was good before, it's great now because we need to, our families need it the most. That's so encouraging to, to hear. Um, I, I wanted to kind of shift quickly to, uh, we know that school is often for many the, the safest place for students in, in some cases. It's also the strongest link to services and, and community information. And so how, how are you finding, or what are the creative methods are you using to reach sometimes the unreachable? We have a, a number of students we know across the country that um, are, are, may already be disconnected from, from learning. We've got students that are homeless. We have English language learners. And uh, we know that uh, there have been struggles connecting with, with families. And so Alejandra, is there anything that you can share about, um, and I say, uh, you know, reaching the unreachable, but clearly there, there are ways to do it. Do you, do you have anything to, to offer in that, in that area? Yeah, I've got a, a few thoughts. So one is, um, uh, as an organization, we've been thinking about who are the, the partners that, that currently have trusting relationships with, with those families and, and how can we uh, share our resources so that the, the partners can, can continue to engage those families in, in meaningful ways. Uh, so that's one thought. Uh, another uh, it has to do with the accessibility uh, of resources. Um, uh, so even, uh, for example, our our web app is deliberately not uh, an app that you need to download uh, uh, from the app store, since that is a barrier that 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 many families uh, uh, you'll lose a lot of families in in that process and parents that are paying attention to to data and, and bandwidth. Um, uh, we're sharing resources uh, via text message, uh, which is uh, more. Uh, it's not ubiquitous, but it, but it's more accessible than um, than necessarily a, a different platform. Um, so that's another thought, but also like. I feel like you got to give families something that's winnable. Uh, that there, there's so much of an emphasis on content, and that content pretty quickly becomes noise and overwhelming. Like I, I don't need 40 different things I could do with my kid today. I need one thing I should do with my kid today, right? Like a, a simple, repeatable process. I think process beats content every day of the week. Um, and, and so, to the extent that organizations can can focus on on that process, what's something winnable that that parents can do over and over again, even if they only have 10 or 15 minutes to, to sit down with their, their child uh, uh, at all. Um, and how do you make that finite? Uh, so it's not this kind of interminable experience uh, that distance learning can, can sometimes feel like. It's finite. We, we got to be able to win at it in five weeks, in 10 weeks, and then we come up for air. Uh, it's, it's not running a marathon, it, it's hit training. Uh, you know, and, and I do believe that if you if you line up a series of small wins, you'll get to the big wins. But if you only focus on the big win and it feels like this kind of amorphous, uh, interminable process to get there, then um, it's going to be hard uh, for families to, to latch on to it. Yeah. Thank you for that. And Melissa, I know you had something to add there. And I just wanted to also say that there are just some children where distance learning is just not a good fit and it's not working for them. And so I would love to have your your comments around that, well, Melissa. There were two things. There were two things I wanted to share. Um, one of our maxims is fail, persist, succeed. Right, and the persist part is really, really important to one determine what it is that can um, engage this child in a way that he or she can begin to engage with us and love learning in a way that they might have loved it when they were live in person. But I wanted to talk about the unreachable in a literal sense. Never give up on finding a family. We've called an assemblyman's office. We called the mayor's office. Today, I have the great pleasure of reporting that a family that we've been looking for for months, we finally reached them. I mean, we've called hospitals and the morgue. I'm being that serious. Do not give up on finding unreachable families especially during these dark times. So that's what I wanted to plug in as well. Thank you. That, that touches my heart uh, because 
we cannot give up on our children and we have to be persistent. And so thank you for that. Uh, Leslie, I'm gonna turn it back over to you because I know we have just a few minutes for audience questions. Yes. Do you so, want to go uh, to that? Yeah, so a couple of questions I'm seeing here. One, um, one is about special, a special package or resources for families with kids who have uh, special education needs or with a learning disability. Any thoughts or resources to share on that? And that's for anybody. You know, I, one of the ones that we turn to all the time is understood.org um, for information for students with, uh, with learning disabilities. Um, but that is a question that we get quite a, quite a bit. Um, I don't know if anybody else has other organizations that, that have material specific and resources for, for kids um, with learning disabilities, but that's one that we turn to quite a bit. Yeah, that's definitely one that we've looked at at NSLA, um, and I will include in a, a link to their resource page in the follow-up email that I'll send out. I, I would just add, uh, as a mom um, of a teenage son, that um, you know it is also the school's responsibility to adhere to the IEP and uh, 504 plans during this time. And so, if um, families are not having those conversations because of whatever reasons, they need to ask for those meetings with their school counselors and to also ask for the kinds of supports that they need right now and also going into the summer because um, they are held by law to adhere to those, um, those intervention plans. Um, so we have a question if, if any of the panelists would be willing to share surveys or survey questions they've asked parents. Um, it's so easy to write now to build summer programs without asking, it's not um, without asking parents what they want or need. So <clears throat> I guess so yeah. if, you, if you reach out to Learning Heroes, we're happy to provide you with some, some guidance. Again, we do qualitative and quantitative research every year, and we're happy to provide some examples of surveys that we've done. And you can get in touch with us through NSLA, or um, I think that's probably the best way to get in touch with us through Laura. Um, quick question for Alejandro. How frequently do children have a program, and, and at what time? So. The, the beauty of, of Fila is that it's, just, it's, it's a process and you can do it at any time. You can do it during the summer and typically that's a five week experience. You can do it in the fall, it's a 10 week experience, winter, spring, um, whenever you wanna set and achieve a goal within five to 10 weeks is a good time to, to do a, a, a Fila. Uh, for, the, for the Teach for America partnership in particular, um, for if you, on our website, uh, there's like a red button that says sign up here. Um, uh, that there's two different schedules. There's a West Coast and, and an East Coast uh, schedule for programming so that families have um, kind of their selection uh, uh, of when they want to participate in the, the workshop uh, as well as when they want their child to, to receive the instruction. Um, you can also just reach out to me if, uh, if you want to share this opportunity with families in, in your network, either as an institution, you can kind of wave your hands and claim a certain number of spots. Or uh, you can reach out in that info at uh, Springboard email and, and I'll share uh, blurbs and flyers that both have more information for families and you can also use them uh, to, to reach out without having to create any new content. Great, and then we have two final questions. So I'm gonna to try to combine them into one. Um, the question, questions are about uh, resources or thoughts around um, hybrid models of learning, so some in-person and some distance learning aspects, and then the idea of going back to school, um, maybe going back in person. So any thoughts about transitioning? Um, I'll add to that. We're in the process of planning. We have six different scenarios, and obviously there's some things that are out of our control. We have to wait for the government to, to share some moves that the city's gonna uh, make um, to open up. So we're preparing for a hybrid model, entirely remote or brick and mortar. And so we're just waiting for guidance about what we will be able to do. But in the process, we're trying to improve the practices of 
delivering quality instruction, getting feedback and asking parents consistently along the way, how is this landing? How can we change? And so it's, it's a little messy, but it's something we have to do so that we can be ready for anything. Great, thank you so much. Um, I want to say thank you to our panelists, uh, to Laura, to everybody for attending today. I want to wrap up with just a couple of announcements. Um, looking at um, our webinar series, this is a part of our Voices of Summer uh, webinar series. Uh, so make sure to look out for announcements for about no, new webinars. Um, to, but tomorrow we're ha having a webinar with um, the American Camp Association. We're going to be talking about guidance for uh, safety and, and um, for in-person programming uh, for camps, summer programs, child care. So please be sure to, to join us for that one. Um, and then another announcement, our National Summer Learning Week will be, the, will be July 6th through 11th this year. This is a important week for us uh, to advocate for summer and celebrate summer. Uh, so look out for more announcements about the, that coming soon. And if you aren't already, please follow us on social media. That's the best way to keep updated on what's happening, on uh, new resources, things like that. Um, and also join our community by joining our email list. Thank you again uh, for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.